you're going to get it quick. It's going to be quality. And it's going to be delivered when you need it. And then once you see that you can get that from us, then you can build that trust. And then we have you enter our ecosystem and stay with us. And that's how we're able to build a really loyal customer base. Welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Expert Perspectives, a podcast by Noibu where we explore the elite strategies and cutting edge insights with our expert guests. Get ready to propel your e-commerce business to the next level with your hosts, Kalen and Philip. Hi everyone, welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Experts Perspective. Joining us today, I'm very excited to chat with Matt Ezek. We actually know each other from two different worlds. I'll let Matt introduce himself. He's currently the director of e-commerce at Pet Supermarket. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, so like you said, I'm at Pet Supermarket. We're one of the country, the U.S.'s largest pet specialty retailers. We operate about 225, 230 stores, growing that footprint as we speak. And I'm responsible for the digital business here. So that's the e-commerce site that runs on Salesforce Commerce Cloud and all of our digital marketplaces we have like Instacart and DoorDash. Awesome. And I mentioned that I know you from two different worlds. So Matt and I originally connected when he was in the agency world. So Matt actually was on the agency world before with Pixel Media, worked as well with Accenture. So I guess my first question is, sounds like you were more so on the agency side, and now you've flipped into running the complete digital business for a 50-year-old plus uh, brick-and-mortar top kind of pet brand. So maybe talk to us a bit about that hop about that journey. And and one thing that maybe uh, surprised you about being a a hands-on operator. Yeah, it's something I've always wanted to do in my career. I've worked with probably over 100 different retail brands, mostly fast fashion, cosmetic brands. So this opportunity came up and it was great. Uh, I think the one thing that surprised me is just all the different moving parts and the different stakeholders internally. I thought I had a pretty good grasp on that, but there's so many moving parts inside the this type of business, you know, going all the way up to finance and fraud and all the different stakeholders that, you know, have questions for you or interact with you. So it's it's really interesting to see how it works from the inside. And then of course the logistics and supply chain piece of it, seeing the the warehouse and how that operates. And it's really, really cool to see the insides of it, inner workings and learn and, and how to interact and how my world can help them grow and, and be more efficient. Awesome. Is there one thing that kind of stuck out? And I know that a lot of people that are going to be listening to this are in similar situations. And I mean, Matt, you and I know each other, but a lot of our customer base as well at Noibu is, or at least part of the customer base are these very strong brands that have traditionally been brick and mortar first retailers. And during kind of that COVID period, a lot more budget started getting allocated towards e-commerce for the first time. And we've seen the demographics kind of shift where maybe some people who'd never tried e-commerce before are now using it at least for a percentage of their spend. So long-winded way of asking you is is kind of going from that strong brand, traditional brick and mortar to a omni-channel, true omni-channel business. Maybe talk us a bit through that and and kind of some of the things that have have been a challenge and and some of the things that you think are are super critical for introducing kind of omni-channel retailing. Yeah, like, I mean, like you mentioned, we we uh, celebrate our 50th anniversary this year, which is pretty crazy. We have a, a strong presence in Florida, which was great when you know in the infancy of this company in the 70s, and then as it started to grow in the 80s. But now that we sell nationally, it makes more sense to you know take what the strongest piece of our business is and expand upon that, which is our stores. Our stores are. Are really cool if you've been in them. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of activity. There's music. There's pets, all different types of animals that you can you can buy. You can adopt. It's just a really cool experience. So the way I look at it is that's our strong suit, and everything that I'm invested in now is to expand upon that. So our customer, which is you know a modern customer that every retailer deals with, right? We we want our stuff and we want it now. How do we do that while still giving them that same store experience? And I mean, we can't do that digitally for everything, right? There's nothing that's going to replace going into a store and picking up a a hamster or a bearded dragon and then learning about it. But we try to take those experiences and start with them digitally, right? Like if you want to buy a bearded dragon, you can go to our site and 
see what they cost, see what they require, what kind of habitat, what kind of food, and then actually go in and make that first purchase. And then the life cycle of that journey as a customer can be digital, right? So maybe you ran out of food and eat it quick. Well, you can go on Instacart and get that delivered. Maybe you're looking for savings, right? And convenience. You can go on our site and sign up for a subscription and get a deal to get that food or whatever consumable product dropped off to you and not even have to think about it or worry about it because you're going to need it anyway. So I look to complement the store from the digital side and we're constantly looking at ways of improving that. Amazing. One question I always like to ask P&L holders, especially where you're in a business, it sounds like e-commerce and digital commerce for this business is something that's relatively new and maybe not something that you guys have been doing for the last 20, 30 years. So maybe talk to me a bit about one of your top area of investment is for this year. How are you thinking of investment this year? I know there's a lot of buzz and chatter and AI. How are you looking to the new technologies to help kind of drive the business forward towards your digital goals? Yeah, my main focus is the customer experience and the different types of technologies that we can use with our tech stack to make that experience great. So one of the things that, you know, I you know, I talked about earlier and I always talk about is the, the stores, right? How do we use the stores to make that customer experience better? So one of the focuses we have this year is ship from store. That's been really transformational in our business because now with the, the Salesforce tech that we have with omnichannel inventory, we are able to get product out to customers very, very quick, quicker than, than most of our competitors, depending where you live, especially in Florida, right? So if you need that bag of food for your dog and you need it now, you can go pick it up in the store. You can get it dropped off same day. And even our traditional shipments with ship from store are lightning fast, right? So I, I live in South Carolina. I don't live near a store, but I have a store about an hour and a half away. And I thought it was really cool that one of my neighbors last week said, hey, I ordered food for my dog at 8 a.m. I got delivered the next day at 11 a.m. It's like crazy. You can see the value of that, right? You rely on those products for your, your pets and you have to have dependability that you're going to get that product. You're going to get it quick. It's going to be quality. It's going to be delivered when you need it. And then once you see that you can get that from us, then you can build that trust. And then we have you enter our ecosystem and stay with us. And that's how we we're able to build a really loyal customer base. I thought it was uh, interesting that our, our social team posted something last month that said, how long have you been in the pet supermarket family? And there's a lot of people that have said, like, I've been buying from you for 35 years or 40 years. It's, it's astounding. So how do we take all this new tech and build that into the customer experience? I mean, I know you mentioned AI too. We've been using predictive AI for quite a while with telling the, the system what a cat is and what a cat needs. And then the Einstein AI and Salesforce can now see that you're shopping for a cat in this example, and then say, okay, you might need litter. You might need a litter box. You might need a cat tree or litter attractant. So that's been very transformational because that helps customers in their journey say like, oh, I need these things and let me add it to the cart and buy it. And obviously that helps us with you know revenue and margins and AOV. So it's a, it's a win-win. And then I think the predictive AI has been great. The generative AI pieces, we're just starting to see real world examples of how that's going to help with with our business in particular. I think we still need to see how that is going to affect our business because there's just so much buzz. There's so many new things coming out. One right away is the generative search, the generative metadata and descriptions that we can use with Salesforce. That certainly is going to help. And then it's just constantly evolving. It's really exciting to see. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I think to your point, you always kind of want to start with the opportunity or the challenge versus starting with the technology and trying to kind of reverse engineer it. But no, I, one thing that actually piques my interest, because I think this could be a really good, sounds like you're building a really solid playbook for someone that's coming into a business that's established brick and mortar, they have stores, and maybe instead of kind of going the path, and I've actually seen this on the vendor side before, where it's everything the business has been doing is cute for the last 50 years, but like, the bulk of it is probably a little wrong. You know, I'm going to come in and I'm going to start changing everything. It sounds like you went a bit of a different of a direction where you said, hey, look, like we have a very strong brick and mortar business. 
it sounds like it's growing past Florida and they're opening up more physical presence. It sounds like the in-store experience is very intimate and very powerful. And you're looking to take that investment and make synergy, make investments above and beyond that to create synergies for the business. And I think one thing that you said that really stuck out to me was they're going to go into the store. They're going to have a great experience. They're going to buy a pet. They're then going to go home. They're going to need cat food or dog food, right? And I think that's one of the main reasons Jeff Bezos bought through Amazon, they acquire Whole Foods is because they had that brick and mortar footprint and that's going to enable them to actually do quicker deliveries. So I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard of a, of a retailer and I know a lot of retailers are doing this that kind of quite exactly put it like you, right? So ship from store is going to delight the customer. It sounds like your neighbor had a much quicker delivery than anticipated. And from there you can control quality as well. What does that do to margins? I guess is my question. Yeah, I think the uh, the verdict's still out. We're still c- compiling data because we actually went live with this chain wide uh, a few weeks ago. But as you can imagine, it's a it's a huge hit to the margin favorability, right? In this case that I gave you with example of my neighbor, instead of shipping from South Florida, we're now shipping from a store that's an hour away. So not only are they getting it quicker, but it's going to cost much less for us to send it there, and that. Uh, works with returns as well. Like we have now implemented Boris, which is an acronym for buy online return in store, which is equally important. I think customers are super savvy now and they want to look at what your return policy is sometimes before they even buy to make sure that if they're spending their money, they know we stand behind our product and we're going to make it as easy as possible for them to, you know, again, get what they need for their animals because it's so critical to, you know, for them to care for their pets. I've never, I definitely never heard of buy online return in store. So I think that's, that's really yeah. good. And I know that kind of the long, and I've been selling into e-commerce well before COVID. And I know one of the criticisms of e-commerce that I would hear even in boardrooms prior to COVID was, yeah, they're spending a lot of money, but like a lot of the profits eroded in like the last mile delivery and like the returns are high. Like there's even people saying, Hey, go order a bunch of stuff, try it on. And traditional e-com and then send it all back, except for the one thing. The people, are, they're treating it like a like a free change room. And I think what you're actually flagging, and I think the business that you're in is, is, is likely very different, but what you're flagging is, once again, leveraging the historical brand and CapEx that's been spent on all these brick and mortar footprints to drive a better customer experience and drive up profitability. So I don't think I've ever heard it articulated so elegantly. So huge kudos to you. I think that's really smart. And I think it's a lot of value to anyone who's listening to this that may be going into a role that you're in right now where it's kind of building up the e-commerce department from the ground up. So that's that's good. Talk to me a bit about, you mentioned Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Why did you go with an SFCC? You also mentioned their omni-channel inventory, but why did you go with a SFCC type platform over something that's a bit more, hey, like, like a big commerce or Shopify where you could basically launch overnight? Maybe talk to me a bit about uh, why that decision was made. Uh, it was before my time, and I was actually brought in because of my experience with Commerce Cloud. We run a full Salesforce stack from service, commerce, marketing, order management, all the way down. So we use several of the products. And I think the decision was made just like a lot of other retailers out there. They want best in breed, scalable solutions that they can grow with. We're obviously looking to grow and scale this business with you know opening more stores, adding more digital capability. So I know from an operator that gives me the the stability that I can grow this business as, as big as I can without having to worry about the tech behind it that's going to be able to handle it. I've seen customers that on Commerce Cloud that do literally billions of dollars in revenue a year. And I just, from the my experience with that, I know I can trust that I have the firepower to, to handle anything I throw at it. Awesome. You mentioned growth. What are, what's your five-year vision or objectives for the digital department? For me, I want to see us activate all the different or pull all the different levers that are available to us. I mean, we have so much potential here with how we can talk to our customers, give them value. We're working on growing our loyalty program, really looking to see how our customers interact with us and, and what they like, what they don't like, and then just it sounds cliche, but the surprise and delight factor uh, is really a focus of mine. So if I think if we focus on that, then everything else will kind of fall into place. So for the next three to five years, 
looking to grow our loyal customer base, find different ways to get them their products quicker, make them happier, make them lifetime customers. Like I said, there's lots of potential there. And we're really just scratching the surface, in my opinion. What's the one KPI you couldn't live without? What's the one KPI that, you know, hey, sometimes things go well, sometimes things are a bit rocky. What's the one KPI at the end of the day that you don't want to drop the ball on? Conversion rate. I can look at that and I can instantly see if something's going well or, or if it's not going well. I know like really fine details of why it is at certain places and why it's not. I always look at that in revenue first, but really it's it's conversion rate, how quickly we can close our sales and how efficient they are. When we run deals, I can really at this point predict where it needs to be. And if it's not there, then I know we need to do something differently. Makes, makes a ton of sense. And this question might be a little biased given your background, but for maybe a company that's going through a similar transition as you guys have, have undergone, how do you guys look at tech teams? Do you think you should bring everything fully in-house? Do you think you need a strong technical leader and then lean upon kind of outsource capabilities? Like, where do you kind of land on the whole tech piece when it comes to e-commerce specifically? I think it varies. It depends on the experience of the team building it. I'm probably a little bit unique where I have over a decade of experience running those types of teams on the agency side. So between myself and my partner in the IT side here, we have a lot of experience doing that. So it was a little bit easier for us to find the right people to bring in. But even with us, we still had to rely on external partners to kind of build the, the base and get us rolling. So finding the right partner from you know, the development side is crucial. Once you build the site, you, know, you want to obviously get the right partner to build it correctly, but also to do the managed services piece of it, making sure they have your back if something goes wrong, knowing how they handle those types of situations. It's really critical because now when we have this built, we're now relying on this revenue that we're seeing. And if something happens and we're not getting it, then we need to have a pretty strong team in place to handle it, whether it's internal or external. So building internally is pretty challenging. I've seen most companies out there have a desire to do it, and it's not easy. That's why uh, that's why these companies out there excel at doing managed services and, and doing it well. We used uh, Phenom Digital, which was, were a great team to work with and loved working with them. Yeah, Phenom's great. We have a lot of customers actually with them as well. No, that's really cool. I'm really glad to hear that. What do you think one of the top things that, e-commerce brands should stop doing on their website? Like what's one thing that you think is kind of like a, a non-starter in, in 2023? I don't think it's new to 23, but forcing customers down a path that they think they should go down without letting them choose that. So whether it's checking out as a guest or certain journeys they have on their site, the way I look at it is that you need to make things easy and available for how they want to check out and how they want to experience your site, and then let them choose how they do that. And that's in the store, too. That's just really taking that same principle. Like, we're not going to force people to go down a certain aisle in a store because that's the most profitable aisle. We, we of course, are going to show them those products and entice them to do that, whether it's through a deal or through its certain graphics or however, do that digitally. But Ultimately, we want the customer to decide how to interact with us, and that's going to turn them into lifetime customers and loyal customers. The more you force a customer to do something digitally, the, it's giving them more reasons to go somewhere else. And you know, obviously, I don't want to do that. Makes sense. I think the analogy you gave in the store is really, really powerful because even when you look at benchmark conversions, like if, even if your online benchmark conversion is like 2%, your in store is likely 10 times that, right? So Clearly, in-store still has the upper hand on conversion. Like, we're not even in the same decimal places. You know what I mean? In, in most cases. So with that said, I think to your point, there is a lot to learn from in-store. It converts high. It's profitable for a lot of businesses. It's still bringing home the bulk of, of the cash flow and, and the revenue. So I really love that analogy of not forcing anyone to go down an aisle just because the margin's higher. And I think it sounds silly when you if you put someone physically walking down that aisle, but online, you could probably do it pretty easily. So as we look to uh, to wrap up here, I'm honored to have you on. You and I have known each other for a bit. I've seen you be on a lot of other podcasts. I know you go to a lot of conferences. 
Did you have maybe any advice for someone looking to grow their career? Maybe they're in they're an aspiring head of digital or they're in a role right now and looking to really ramp up. What's kind of broad stroke piece of advice for an e-commerce professional that either you've heard or, or is a mental model for you that you think is really, really important? For me, it's networking, right? Build your network. The more people you know, the easier it is for you to open yourself up to more opportunities. I tell a lot of folks that have worked for me in the past the same thing. You never know where you know a conversation or a relationship is going to take you. And I always look at these relationships as something where, like, how can I help that person without any thoughts of re- reciprocation in return, right? I look to go and pay it forward as much as I can, you know, with the people I choose to network with. And I've built my network over time, so it's it's been profound, right? So that's probably the, the best thing that you can do, in my opinion. I would tend to agree with that. And I think what you just mentioned is also present in some of the work that you're doing. And I think you in a lot of ways, treat your customers like that as well, where it's like, hey, how can I provide value to you as a customer with no expectation of return? And I think to your point, that creates like a positive multiplier over time and dividends will start coming down the road and it'll all kind of take care of itself. So no, I, I think that's uh, that's great advice. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for for blessing us with your time and, and your wisdom, Matt. It's been a pleasure chatting. If anyone wants to look you up, I know you're, you're on LinkedIn. Uh, is that a best way to kind of reach out to you or you're on Twitter or any other platform as well? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can find me there. Just type my name in. Yeah, I'm always uh, engaged with the latest things going on and you know, looking forward to uh, learning more about all the new tech that's coming out this year. And I'm going to be sharing some, some insights from that as I head to some of these larger conferences this year, like Dreamforce. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time, Matt. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Take care. The e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives is brought to you by Noibu. To find out more about Noibu and how we can help you debug your e-commerce site and rocket your revenue, visit www.noibu.com. That's N-O-I-B-U.com. And then make sure to search for the e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Noibu, thanks for listening.